Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honour to me to be uh, here this evening and to help launch this uh, weighty tome in many senses of that word. And uh, I'm afraid I'm going to bring the proceedings slightly down to earth um, because I have a feeling there's quite a lot of volume three matter in what Edward has been talking about, which maybe doesn't come over terribly well on what we've got at the moment, which is um, more factual. And I, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to be um, saying what was in the book or commenting. And I thought I'd do a little bit of both on the basis that maybe not everybody has got to the end of volume two and I've been asked to, to refer to two chapters at the end of Volume 2. So the, the first one, uh, Jinyan Lee's one on triple non-taxation, rather fascinated me. Um, there are two examples in this, and they both concern Canadian companies um, and Hong Kong and China. In the first one, the Canadian company with the sub in Hong Kong does some services in China, no tax because they do it for less than six months, no tax in Hong Kong because the um, income arises outside Hong Kong, and no tax in Canada, which is perhaps more strange, um, because dividends from Hong Kong are from a designated treaty country, and they're exempt. The second example is just slightly different, but the same countries involved. The um, Chinese company is now manufacturing in China, and it's paying deductible interest and royalties to Hong Kong. So they're deductible in China, and they're subject to a, a treaty reduced rate of 7%. No tax in Hong Kong as before. Now Canada um, regards the interest and royalties as active business income because they're paid out of active business income, and there's um, therefore no CFC implications to that. And then, as before, the uh, dividends and interest, uh, sorry, the, the interest and royalties get redistributed by the Hong Kong company as dividends, and we've seen that, that those dividends are exempt. There's absolutely nothing that, that BEPS would object to, I, I think you'd agree with me. Um, in all of that, they just happen to be the interaction of two treaties and domestic law, and if Canada liked to change its domestic law, it obviously could do at any time. It's, it's not going to, though. Um, because treaties are not absolutely um, there on tax policy grounds. They're there partly to encourage investment in, in various regions through various, various ways. So going on, um, you, you've dealt with some of this, Eduardo, but I'll just, just reiterate some of it. Um, <coughs> the, the countries that are involved, quite an interesting change over time that uh, we've got the Netherlands and the UK um, much more litigating, litigating about tax treaties in the 90s, and then in the 2000s the US takes over much more, um, and a lot of countries um, have almost all their disputes are with the, with the US. So that becomes a terribly important treaty. I mean, take um, treaties with Canada and the UK the US is, is a fifth of all the tax disputes. Um, so that's, I think, an interesting point which comes out from these statistics, the change over time in the, in the countries involved. Um, fairly obviously, I think, the next point that most disputes are in the source state. Well, I think you'd expect that in, with treaties. And uh, certainly now, Germany and the US are the major players in, in tax disputes. But of course we've seen from your um, your charts about the hubs and how they've changed. The, the Switzerland in the 80s, Netherlands in the 90s, and Netherlands and Belgium later. We've really dealt with this as well. I, I, I should have sort of uh, asked you what you were going to say first or taken more notice of what you were going to say first. Um, but I thought that was absolutely fascinating. That's uh, one of the most interesting points, I think, to come out of those conclusion chapters is the government success rate. Now, why is it that it's only 30% in France? 
and it's double that in a lot of other developed countries. And in fact, they're not even what I thought. Um, China, I, I think we can ignore for this purpose because they're not cases at all. They're, they're not an independent court deciding something. It's the tax authority deciding something. Well, of course they're going to get 100% success rate. Um, but, but leave that out. Japan, I always thought the taxpayer never won, but that doesn't come out from, from the statistics. Um, the UK is actually higher than I would have guessed at, at 60%-ish. I would have guessed it was marginally over 50%. But of course, it's these things, uh, partly I suspect, I suspect is the fairly small number of tax treaty cases compared with all cases. And maybe I'm my gut reaction is closer to all than, than, it, than the difference in tax treaties. But I thought really fascinating um, stuff there. Wide variation between treaty articles as well. Now why is it the government's success rate on Article 5 is 25% and 80% on Article 13? I, I don't have an answer to this, but I didn't know that, that was the situation until I read the book. So one can now start thinking about what the consequences of of some of these might be. Similarly with the article numbers, the classification of disputes according to article, the article number um, is again fascinating stuff. Um, where, which countries are disputing which articles? And you've got it on the, on the slide. I mean, in a sense, you can, you can expect um, fewer permanent establishments in OECD countries mattering and therefore you, the disputes go down and they're much higher in, in countries where permanent establishments matter much more. But I wouldn't have guessed necessarily that um, Article 10 is important in Italy, Korea, Turkey and Russia. Um, it seems terribly important in Russia. Um, and why do we get these these article numbers? Again, um, there are points I didn't realize were happening, and now I do realize that they're happening. One can see or inquire into um, why they're happening, and I think that's a particularly fascinating point that's coming out of these statistics. And, and again, if you look at the, the last point in the slide, the combining the article number and, and looking at both states, you know, 40% of Australia and US treaty cases about Article 7 and 11. Amazing, isn't it? They, they, they narrow down um, very considerably. Mutual agreement uh, procedure. Well, again, I think there's good statistics on this from the OECD and, and Europe as well. Um, so I think it's less um, strange to know who the major players are. Um, but what I think I didn't realize was a decline in litigation in Germany um, as a result of this. Uh, and in a sense, that's to be expected. And I think the way the, the world is going is arbitration. I don't want to say anything about arbitration because Sophie's going to do it all in a moment. Um, but arbitration is the perfect solution because it, it ties up both countries and nothing else does. In, in litigation, so there's a, a great advantage in arbitration. Now, if arbitration works, uh, it's going to get rid of these map cases, not because they all arbitrate, but because they're frightened off by arbitration. Now, I'm afraid I haven't got the statistic with me, but I have a clear recollection, I think, that when uh, the US and Canada introduced uh, arbitration, all the map cases disappeared overnight, practically. Um, because everybody knew, well, if we don't, don't settle this case, it's going to arbitration, that's going to be an awful nuisance, and there's not very much in it for either of us, so why don't we settle it? Um, I see that happening um, globally, and obviously we haven't got any statistics yet, because it's, this is the future, this is probably volume four, isn't it, <laughs> that uh, we, we come to that. But that's going to be, I think, an absolutely fascinating uh, development for the future. And then if I can just add some thoughts, uh, I'm not intending to be critical of the book, but I just raised some questions in, in my mind ab about this. This definition that a leading case is one that's been cited uh, once, either in court or I think by the tax authority. Um, 
Now, that seems, that's obviously objective, and objectivity is obviously desirable when you're making a statistical analysis. But doesn't it give some strange results? Um, if you have a country with lots of treaty, treaty cases, they're more likely to get cited. Uh, if you have, at the day before the end of your period, a Supreme Court case of obvious um, great importance, um, it hasn't yet had time to be cited, so it's not an important case. Um, now, I, I notice that the, the list is checked against the IBFD beta da database, which is much more subjective, and so we may, of course, have picked up some cases like that or got rid of some cases like that. Um, but I, I, I look, for example, for an Irish case. I remember writing an, up an Irish case on treaty interpretation for the ITLR, and I looked to see if it was there, and it wasn't. And I suspect that's because um, there are not many Irish cases, and therefore there's no time to cite them in another case, that sort of thing. But I, I, I just raised that. Now, I thought another fascinating point was dealing with the fact that you get high numbers of cases in some countries and, and quite small numbers in other countries. And how that's been dealt with is to take the proportion of cases, um, not the number of cases, so that, and I, I, I love this, one UK ca case counts for the same as 20 German cases. Now, speaking as an ex-UK judge, of course, I think this is absolutely marvellous, but <laughs> the, the, the word statistically, in brackets, is rather important to that, uh, to that sentence. But I think that does deal with, uh, with a lot of problems which one wonders uh, how, how they're going to be dealt with. Um, the hubs, I'm, I'm not entirely perhaps clear what's happening about them, because we know that Switzerland, Netherlands, and, and um, Belgium are terribly important in numbers of cases, but the main analysis is per G20. And they do occur in that, but they occur as treaty partners. So um, if you say there are a huge number of cases in Germany, it doesn't seem to come out to me that there are huge numbers of cases in the Netherlands. Now, am I missing something on, on that? Um, and the other point on... Um, on cases is the status of the court. Now, certainly um, when one is looking at a foreign case, uh, uh, speaking as an ex-judge again, um, the status of the, of the court in the other country is a rather great interest. Uh, a Supreme Court case counts a lot more than, than some very minor case. Now, um, that doesn't seem to come into the, into the, to the statistics here. But again, I, I may be wrong, and maybe that, that, that one couldn't. Well, I think that's probably all I, um, all I intended to say, and um, those are not intended to be critical remarks, they're just questions I'm raised in my mind. But gosh, what statistics we now have about tax treaty cases that we had no idea existed. And so congratulations to Eduardo and all the other authors for producing such a fascinating uh, result.